Greetings, ladies and mental gents, and welcome to this daily science fiction extravaganza, commonly known as Tales, Tales from Out from space. Out, space, out, space. Out, space. Taken from the subreddit HFY. All the relevant links will be down below. And, as always, I hope that you enjoy. And if you do, please consider supporting the channel. On to the science fiction. Just a little addendum to the intro, letting you know that this Saturday at 9pm GMT, I will be doing a stream where I will be opening up some Magic the Gathering booster packs. This will be in preparation for the big Warhammer TCG box opening that will be happening sometime at the end of the month. I hope to see you all there. Story number one. Unbreakable, written by Regento. The brown and green quith female crooked an eye at that, her smooth damp skin glistening in the dim light of the bar. So you want to know about humans, do you? she asked, smiling a sad smile and looking down at a drink for a moment. I don't blame you, they, they seem like a wild species to most... One of the only five sapient death world species to ever break the light speed barrier, and by far the most interesting of the five, she said with a sigh. But you already know that, don't you? Of course you do, she said, chuckling softly and taking a large gulp from the mug in front of her. If you sure you've heard all the stories about how unstoppable they are, how it is impossible to break them or beat them down... She said, bringing a chuckle from the few of the barflies that were eavesdropping. Yes, yes, they truly have an amazing ability to survive whatever the universe throws at them. Don't they? She said sardonically. Well, she said, keeping her breath as if she was readying herself for something. I know for a fact that it isn't always true. Okay, okay, calm down, she said, drawing a bit of attention before taking another long pull from her mug. I'll tell you my story, but you're not going to like it. It started just as a normal day, as stories like these always do, she said, eliciting another chuckle from the now-grown crowd of eavesdropping barflies. Like any other, I clawed out of my nice, warm, sleeping bog into the crisp morning air that leaked in through the windows, shrugged off my moisture retainer and set of clothes, grabbed a fish from my tank for breakfast and headed towards the door. It was another idyllic day and the French, another day at work like any other, she said, her eyes glazing over slightly as she started to get lost in the memory. I hopped on a shuttle and headed into her office. I'd worked from home for the past week due to a cold, so I thought that I would be good to get out and see my co-workers in person after being cooped up for so long. To my surprise and delight, the acquaintance of mine, a human janitor by the name of Frank, whose company I had come to enjoy, was sitting at one of the desks. He was asleep by the looks of things, with a content smile on his face. She said, smiling fondly at the memory, before shuddering for some reason and taking a deep breath in through her nostrils. He was a quiet man, but hard-working, and he always seemed to have something nice or interesting to say whenever he did speak. She said, her voice trembling slightly as she described the human. He looked peaceful like he was getting some much-needed rest after pulling an all-nighter, so I decided there was no harm in letting the janitor rest and made my way back to my desk, swallowing down the last of the fish as I walked, she said, making some of the listeners commit about how they'd been there before. I sat down and settled into the happy monotony of my job for a few hours, till a loud scream grabbed my attention, she said, making a me eavesdropping hush their whispers as they realized the story was about to get interesting. I stood up and quickly located the source. The supervisor, a female quith like myself, was standing by Frank's desk, screeching in terror. I ran over, like many of my co-workers, and joined the murmuring crowd and had gathered looking for answers. She said, her voice trailing off to a whisper and making everyone lean in a bit closer. 
Everyone at the front of the pack was strangely still and silent, so I carefully pushed my way past them and instantly saw why. Frank was lying limply on the floor, his chair knocked over, and that same peaceful smile was on his face, the supervisor quickly sobbing in the corner of his cubicle, she said, shuddering slightly as she remembered the scene. I reacted out of hand and tentatively touched Frank. He was uh, cold and lifeless. Frank was dead, she said quietly, looking down at her hand as she did so. The crowd was dead silent, and when she stopped looking at her hand, she looked around. From the look on her face, I can tell you that you want to know how he died. What could have possibly killed the unkillable, indomitable human? Well, he killed himself, she said, making everyone express some form of either shock or disbelief. She continued talking, raising her voice slightly to talk over the crowd. He brought a pen of the human insulin under the guise of a family member needing it and injected the entire thing into himself. He was dead long before I found him at his desk, she said, tipping back her mug till it was empty. What? she asked, setting down the mug. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I don't blame you. I wanted to know why, too. After all, it seemed too fantastic to be true. All of the stories that humans dying are all about them bravely sacrificing themselves or fighting against a force that they had no hope of beating and taking with them as many enemies as they could. But I guarantee you that for every one of those stories, there's one like mine, especially on the Rim Worlds, she said, looking down at her mug and waving over the bartender when she saw that it was empty. Her order was interrupted by one of the most inebriated patrons slurring something about fringe and rim. What? she asked, prompting him to repeat himself. Oh, no, you're, you're not wrong. I did say the planet we were on was a fringe world, not a rim world. The start of the rim was about a hundred light years away at least. It's relevant, I promise. I explain everything, just give me a moment, she said, slightly disgruntled as she finished giving the bartender her order and waiting patiently for him to refill her mug. She took a long pull from it before continuing her story. Anyways, as I said, I wanted to know if I could have prompted Frank to do this, so I asked the only person I thought might know something, Dave, the other human that worked in the office. She said, smiling as she recalled the man. Dave had a reputation as someone that you can talk to about anything, especially if you were looking for advice, as he had probably been through a lot worse. She said, still smiling as she played through the murky brown foam on her beverage. Dave grew up in the industrial world about fifty light years away in what was then the middle of the room. From what I heard, it was pretty rough. Union busting raids, monopolies, gangs, typical rim world, lawless but profitable by any means necessary. At least, profitable for those on the top anyways, she said, swallowing dryly. His family worked together, saving up money in secret, then stowing away on a transport headed Corwood, hopping from planet to planet as their money allowed it, and working odd and factory jobs when it didn't, she said sighing and sinking into a chair slightly. Eventually, they ended up on the fringe, where things were much easier for them. Food was cheaper, work was more plentiful, and after a while, Dave and his siblings were able to get decent educations. As she described the human's family putting itself up by sheer will, the other patrons smiled briefly before remembering what they had previously been talking about. Long story short, he ended up working in the same office as Frank and I, she said, obviously deep in some memory or another. Anyways, after giving him a week or two to mourn his fellow human, I approached him and asked what could have possibly prompted Frank to take his own life. I'll never forget the response I got, she said, a shiver running down her spine. Dave sat down and sighed loudly before saying he didn't have anything keeping him here anymore. I balked at that. She said with a pained chuckle at sullen silence settled over the now noticeably large crowd. I asked him what he meant by that, that the statement made no sense. After all, Frank was a human. What could possibly be so bad that a human decides to give up like, uh, like, uh, one of us? 
She shivered once more and opened her mouth for a moment, only to close it and bite her lip. Dave didn't like that. He got very angry and asked me what I know about Frank's living conditions. She said, her girls flushed in shame. I admitted that I didn't know much, and he told me that ever since Frank got on world, he'd been bouncing from job to job, city to city, living out of a large electric van that he put together from parts that he'd had to steal from the scrapyard. He told me that Frank was barely eating enough to sustain himself, and that he had been sending most of his paycheck to his family out on the room so that they could join him here some day, she explained, sighing into her mug and taking another large gulp. While that sounded difficult, it didn't seem like something that would break a human, especially with their tendency towards modern nomadism. That there was one part of that story that stood out, so I asked, Frank was sending money back to his family? She slumped forward, resting her forehead on the table and taking a deep, shuddering breath. They responded with two words, yes, was, she said once again forcing a hush on the crowd as they realized the implications. It turned out Frank had not been as lucky as Dave. Frank's family lived on a cartel world, she explained, making a couple of people wince and hiss. Exactly, she said, sighing as she slumped back into a chair, as if resigning herself to tell the rest of the story. Frank's family had been saving up as much as Dave's had, but before they could afford to get everyone smuggled off planet, Frank's father was injured working in one of the factories. They had enough money to treat it, but without his income, she began, but couldn't seem to find the right words. In the end, they decided to send Frank off-world and try to get a better job and secure a place for them to reunite eventually. That was the plan, at least, until the Federation decided to take apart the cartel, that is, she said the pained expression on her face finding itself on several of the crowd as well. His family took in the wounded soldier that got shot in the shanty town that they were living in during the one of the early assaults, she explained, staring deeply into her mug. They saved the young soldier's life and gave her everything they had on the workings of the cartel that they had figured out after the years of living on the world. The fastest routes around town, known safe houses and floating casinos, collaborators, hidden shuttles, information that the soldier took back to the commanders then would prove to be extremely useful in taking down the cartel, she said, draining the last of a mug with the deepest sigh. They would have been hailed as heroes when the town was liberated. That is, if one of the neighbors didn't see the soldier sneaking out once she was healed enough to walk, she said a distant anger visible behind the drunkenness in her eyes. By the time the soldier came back with the rest of the army, Frank's family had already been publicly executed. The soldier, she began, after a long pause of staring hatefully at her empty mug, showed up on the planet the day before Frank killed himself, she said, closing her eyes and taking a deep breath. She told Frank that his family saved her life, they gave their information that they needed to keep any of the cartel from getting away, that they were heroes and that they were dead. She said, her voice dripping with sadness. She told him that he should be proud of them, that they did the stories of humanity proud, and that she was sorry for his loss. A hush fell over the crowd that nobody seemed to want to break the quith sat staring sadly at her drink. They were the only ones keeping Frank going, day after day, of going to bed hungry and tired and cold in a cramped vehicle that he put together with parts that he had to beg, borrow, and steal for. And the only thing that was keeping him together was the thought that with each day, with each paycheck, he was getting closer and closer to bringing his family to him. And now they were dead, she said smiling sardonically and closing her eyes. You know the funny thing? Humans have a saying about themselves. More of an excuse, really. They call it only human, she said, smiling slightly. Sorry, I made a mistake. I'm only human, they say. Or, I can't possibly do that. I'm only human, after all. Or, even, I need help. Please, I can't do this on my own. I'm only human, she said bringing a tear to many eyes capable of crying. 
The worst part is that Dave told me about how Frank saw the rest of us. Frank didn't think that he could come to any of his colleagues with his problems. He didn't think that they'd take him seriously. He's human after all. What could possibly break a big, strong human in our eyes? What problems could they possibly have that we could relate to? She asked, making looks of shame and discomfort spread throughout the crowd as everyone realized that they thought that exact same thing at some point. Well, take it from me that humans aren't unbreakable. They're the hardest to break species that I've ever known. True juggernauts of willpower, she said, smiling weakly. But they still feel pain. They still feel depression. They're still sapiens, just like you and me. They struggle along through life just like the rest of us, clinging from one bit of hope to the next, like the rest of us. And sometimes they break, like the rest of us, she said before smiling and taking another deep breath. So... Do humans a favor. Don't always assume that they'll be fine or that they are always happy and healthy. It'll go a long way for them to know that we care about them as much as they care about us, she said, motioning the bartender over to pay a tab. Your tab's been taken care of, the bartender said, nodding in the direction of a lone human sitting at the table, raising a glass in her direction. His eyes were red, and his cheeks were wet with tears. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this dose of science fiction fun. I hope that you enjoyed. And if you did, please don't forget to support the author from the link down below. But if you want to support this channel, there are links as well down below for you to help with, but the easiest way would be to share this video. And if you are so inclined, subscribe as well. I will see you all in the next episode, and I hope that you all have a fantastic time until then. Cheers.